Okay, welcome everyone. Let's get started. So my name is Chris Phelps. I'm from uh, Boulder, Colorado. Work at a company called Tendril. Uh, we do what we call uh, energy intelligence. It's using what we know about building science and behavioral science and things we know about people and uh, their usage and things like that to help understand how people use energy and optimize how they use energy. So when we started to build this platform four or so years ago, we wanted to achieve the kinds of uh, illities that we talk about in the reactive manifesto. We wanted a system that was responsive uh, to uh, customer requests. We wanted one that was elastic that we could scale out uh, and not run into problems with uh, the number of instances that we had to run in a data center or things like that. We wanted it to be re uh, resilient to failure. And so all those things led us to uh, asynchronous all the way down and the futures kind of approach to do things. And as part of that, we ended up st uh, standardizing on Finagle. Uh, we wrote uh, Finagle Protobuf as a plugin to Finagle to work with protocol buffers as our wire format. Uh, so that brought us into Twitter futures. We wanted our engineers to be able to write in, Sc uh, in Java as well as Scala, so that caused us to look at how can we uh, make these things easily available from Java, and that led us to Guava listenable futures. And now, subsequently, with Java 8, we have completable futures. So I have uh, my engineers always wondering, which of these should I use? How far should I use them? When should I change from one type to another? So what is a future, really? Um, so this was an interesting interchange uh, on Twitter a year or so ago. Um, futures are values. They may have a computation associated with them that's producing that value, but you should really think about it as a value, and the value is just not there yet. It's an interesting, different way to think about this. So a little bit of a history lesson. Back in the, the bad old days, uh, Java, we only had um, basically two things that we could do with futures. We could ask if they were done, and we could block until they were done. So if we wanted to kind of keep checking, you know, we'd have to pull, we'd have to do weird things that way. There was very little that we could do to observe and react. Uh, Twitter and, and Akka both um, experimented with um, putting callbacks onto futures. So both uh, the Twitter future and Akka's future at the time allowed you to set up a callback uh, when a future succeeded, when the value was available. When the future failed, the value was a failure. Uh, your callbacks would be called and executed. Uh, in 2012, um, that was a uh, Scala improvement process back to um, Scala, and from 2.10 on, we have a nice future abstraction in the Scala standard library. So a quick outline of what we're gonna do in this talk. We'll talk about Scala futures and kind of some of the basics of how they work. Then we'll compare the Twitter future. In a little less detail, we'll go into Guava uh, listenable futures. We'll talk about Java's completable futures from, that we have in Java 8 forward. I'll really briefly talk about tasks and then I'll give you my overall uh, recommendations. So let's jump right in. So what makes a future uh, in Scala standard library? This is a type that has three states. It can either be unresolved, can be resolved with a success, and when it is resolved successfully, it has a value of whatever type, which incidentally may be unit, but, um, or it could be resolved with a, failable in which, uh, a failure, in which case we have a throwable for what the exception, what the problem was. We have uh, helpers to set up immediately resolved instances. That's useful when we're building tests. That's useful when we're building, um, we might have a, a, a branch and in one um, case we're doing some more computation. In another case we just immediately supply an answer, uh, which may be a failure or a success. Promises, I'll get into promises a little bit more, but promises and uh, an ability to provide a value that somebody else can look at uh, as a future. And there's a bunch of nice combinators that help us do things with that, and we'll look at some of those. So how can we get uh, an instance of a future first? So let's talk about from the client perspective, right? First of all, I can call some library function somewhere that returns a future. Pretty obvious, but pretty boring, right? What's more interesting is when I'm a provider, how can I get one? How can I make one? So future has an apply method that we can use to create a new future, or we can make a promise, and uh, we'll look at both of those. So with apply, we need our um, implicit uh, execution context. I'll talk more about that in a couple slides. Um, we have future, pass it a block. So this is calling future apply. 
uh, and then um, the body of this will be executed. Um, we'll get back a future. We can then do stuff with it. Alternately, we can create a future as a promise. So in this case, we're going to uh, create promise with its uh, apply method, um, return the future end from that. Um, so this new, my new future, I can then pass around to a client that's gonna consume this. Start my calculation somewhere, uh, and then when it's done, I call success on the promise or failure on the promise to resolve it. And the way this works, we have a uh, producer and a consumer. Producer makes this promise and he gives the future end of that back to this consumer. The consumer can then register his callbacks. At some point when the calculation's done, producer completes the promise, and at that point the callbacks are executed for the uh, consumer. So callbacks uh, look something like this. We um, set up our future uh, with our calculate here. Uh, we then have an oncomplete, which takes a partial function. We can match on the success case to do whatever our happy path is, match on the failure case to do whatever our failure handling is. Um, we also have these individual on success and on failure. Those are technically deprecated in 2.12, but they're still available um, to set those up independently. So combinators. Once we have a future, we want to start composing it and doing more stuff with it. Uh, so the two basics that we have are map and flat map. Uh, map lets us take and do an operation once the value is present and immediately return a value. By immediately, that may take some time, but we're not doing something that is intrinsically future-y, creating a new future, a new um, uh, asynchronous boundary, if you will. Flat map, on the other hand, is one where we are gonna introduce that extra layer of asynchronous. We're gonna make some other call and get another future back. And we want to chain those futures together rather than having any sort of nesting of futures. So that's what map and flat map would be for. We um, get our future uh, somewhere uh, by calling some calculate. Uh, in this case, I have a scale method that takes an int and returns an int, and I'm gonna map it onto that future. So when uh, my future resolves, this uh, map body will fire. Uh, I'll do the scale calculation. This returns another future, so I have scaled now, and I can do the same thing. I can map on, I can flat map on, I can do other combinators. Um, so recalculate is uh, another example here where now uh, the recalculate method does some kind of future -y thing. Maybe that's going off to a, to a third party service or something like that. So I'm gonna take, um, and I guess I should have said scaled that flat map instead of mapped flat map. Um, but once I have the value from scaled, then I can go off and do the recalculate, uh, get a future back from that, those future contexts are combined together. Now map and flat map are, give us a nice piece of syntax sugar in Scala, which is for comprehension. So by having map and flat map and a couple other things, um, we can do a for comprehension here, we can say for A from calculate, B from recalculate with the value from A, yield scale of B, and this all gets chained together, produces a future, chained is gonna be a future event. Uh, we can set up callbacks on that or do other things from that as we want. A Few other interesting combinators I wanted to point out. Uh, fold left is for when we have an iterable of a bunch of them and we wanna combine them all up to compute one single value. First completed of, if we have uh, multiple uh, futures and we want to let them race each other. Maybe we're calling uh, three different instances of my third party service and I wanna take whichever one finishes first. Uh, maybe I wanna play a game where I have a cache and, a, and an actual computation and whichever one comes back first is the one I want. If we've got it cached, that'll be fast. If not, that has to still process. Um, and sequence lets us go from a list of futures to a single future of list, right? So I, have, I go off and I make uh, three different calls and I want to take those all together, combine them up when they're all available. I wanna have all those values as a list that I can operate on. Now this takes traversable once. Uh, I've put the dot, dot, dot in here. Uh, one of the things that we're passing in here on the dot, dot, dot is can build from. So this actually works for any of the collection uh, kind of types and we'll get that in terms of the right collections type. 
Uh, the other thing that happens in all these dot, dot, dots are the execution context. So all these bodies, all this, uh, the work that's going on in these transforms gets submitted to an execution context to run. And it's up to that execution context to decide whether that creates a new thread or how it, exactly it runs it. Uh, in my examples, you noticed I took the uh, implicit global execution context. Uh, that global execution context uh, uses a fork join pool that by default's configured based on the number of cores you have. You can change that configuration. Uh, but you can also provide any executor uh, you want in order to construct a, um, an execution context uh, that you're gonna use. So why might you do that? Why might you provide something other than the global? One is that you wanna control your pool. You wanna know how many threads are in it. You wanna configure it for different purposes. Uh, you might want to segregate certain kinds of work into a different pool. You've got one that's tuned for certain kinds of operations and another that's tuned for other kinds of operations. Uh, and if you wanna use this fork join pool, you're gonna do a lot of long running operations that are going to block, which we probably shouldn't do anyway. We wanna to try to do this async and non-blocking all, all the time. But if we're going to block those threads and they're gonna be long running, fork join pool probably isn't the best for us um, the way that that guy works. Um, it, you, you can get thread starvation and stuff like that if you don't have that configured correctly. So now let's compare how Twitter future is different. Twitter's uh, future uh, has some different combinators, has a different execution model, and it supports calculation. So Twitter did some of this work, right? They um, were part of the proposal to get things back into Scala standard library, but they haven't standardized on the stuff in the Scala standard library. Why is that? Cancellation is one of the big things that they don't wanna give up, uh, that they wanna continue using their future for, and we'll talk about that in a little more. So a bunch of the standard combinators are still there and they look pretty much the same. Uh, filters, flattens, maps, fat, flat maps, uh, with filters, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we can still do four comprehensions, all that kind of thing. Uh, there's a little tiny difference in here that uh, I'll talk about later, but basically these, um, uh, these signatures all look the same. There's new combinators that Twitter adds. So um, by and within are about timings uh, so we'll get a new future that completes at a time or at a timeout. Uh, parallel is to let us do a bunch of things in parallel and get back a list of futures. Um, select lets us grab the first one uh, of a bunch of futures that finishes. Uh, the signature's kind of weird there. It's giving us the first one that finishes and all the rest uh, in another sequence. Um, when lets us say, um, if this condition is true, execute the thing, and while do says while this uh, condition is true, keep, uh, keep doing these things. And you notice that um, when and while do are both returning future of unit, so we just get a callback that fires that just tells us that these other things are complete. It doesn't give us a value for those things. So the theme for a lot of these uh, additional ones that Twitter provides are about observing or choreographing other futures. Um, to give you some indication, um, Scala standard future, uh, including the companion object, has somewhere around 31 uh, functions. Uh, Twitter and its companion, Twitter future and its companion object have around 80. So um, a bunch more variants um, and things like this. Some of the combinators that Twitter provides are the same as ones in the Scala standard library, but they have different names. So instead of is completed, we have is done. Instead of value, we have poll. Instead of recover, we have handle. Recover with, rescue. Zip, join, and zip with, join with. If you look at these, the um, signatures between these two are pretty much exactly the same. Names obviously uh, different, but there's one thing, one detail that I left out uh, on the top, which is execution context. Some of these, the Scala versions, provide an execution context that Twitter ones don't. So what's up with that? Twitter execution model's different from Scala's. So the transform bodies are gonna be executed in the thread that resolves the prior future. So um, if we set up a pipeline um, and have a bunch of maps and flat maps and so on, uh, combining these things together, uh, once one uh, thread resolves a future, that same thread will execute the callbacks for the subsequent future, the subsequent chained uh, future, and on and on. Um, I don't know if there's a guarantee of order 
uh, if you have multiple uh, callbacks on the same future. Uh, but this should proceed in a more or less depth first sort of fashion. Now one, one gotcha, if any of you guys saw me on Twitter, I said last week that something surprised me while I was preparing these. Turns out, so this is, a, this is an easy bug to write, if a future is already resolved when you add a callback to it, that callback's going to immediately execute in your calling thread, not in the thread of the future. Um, so because all these things are a little bit different, we're not submitting to an, uh, to a, an execution context to get our pool. Uh, all our future creation needs to be done explicitly in a future pool. So we would take and uh, get a future pool. Um, there's some default ones provided, this unbounded pool. Uh, is, is kind of a standard one that we can grab. Uh, this first one is a nice little bug that I wrote. Um, I assume that this would be just like Scala, and, um, but it's not. This is not happening in the pool. This is happening immediately in my thread. So if calculate's expensive, um, that's kind of ugly, and this is an easy gotcha, an easy bug to write. Instead, I need to take that pool, and now in pools apply, um, I can perform that calculate and then that gets submitted as, a, as an execution or a, a task, a callable into that pool. All these guys, I didn't put types on these. Um, both uh, not F when we called the future apply and F where we called the pools apply are both going to give us futures. But in the first case, the work is going to be happening in, uh, immediately in my thread. And the future, by the time it returns, will already be resolved. So cancellation. So can Twitter, Twitter talks about cancellation and make a big deal about cancellation, but um, this is really just a lightweight sort of cancellation. This is a cooperative cancellation. Uh, the producer has to, has to cooperate in this and, uh, and play along. So in a promise, uh, on the promise interface, we have a method raise uh, that marks the promise as interrupted. The future does not resolve automatically. The future keeps running. Also on the promise API, we have is interrupted. So the producer that's doing some work can call is interrupted and determine whether uh, we, it's in an interrupted state. And if it is, resolve itself with a failure. But it can easily just keep doing its thing. Future can resolve successfully. Um, the last one that I want to mention here is raise within. Raise within creates a new future that's going to fail after the timeout. So that one does pay attention, but again, your underlying future is, is still running, is still doing its thing, unless it tries to pay attention to whether it's interrupted or not. So an example of that, I've got a promise. Uh, I, in the pool, start to execute an expensive calculation. Um, if once that first part of the calculation is done, if I'm interrupted, I match on that. Uh, and if I am, I set my exception, I fail out. And if I'm not uh, interrupted, then I go ahead and I do next calculation uh, to complete myself successfully. Um, from a client perspective then, I would be taking that, that future that I've got uh, and calling raise on it in order to say, I want you to stop. Um, a legal state exception, I give up. If you're working with um, Twitter and Scala, what's an easy way to get between these two types? Um, so Twitter bijection is a nice library that lets us do this, provides us some of these uh, um, conversion methods. Um, so we, first of all, I've imported future and Twitter future and give them good names. Uh, I import, import as method and util bijections, then I can create a Twitter future and uh, response dot as Scala future to turn that into a Scala future. Um, and the same thing to go backwards. And bijection supports the nice uh, property that if we go back and forth between these, we're not going to be wrapping more and more onto them. So the first time that we do one, it's gonna be setting up something very like the promise with callbacks to resolve that promise. Uh, but it's also gonna be then storing that original contained future, so then when I try to go back and round trip it, I get the original one back. And it's memoizing that one that I just, uh, that I just made, so if I go back a third time, I get the same one. 
So listenable future. Guava, the Guava library was really nice for Java back in uh, um, late, uh, late 20 single digits. Um, it brought some nice functional stuff to Java. Uh, if you were stuck in Java, it was a nice thing to use. Um, you had the kinds of things that we're used to in Scala for collections, um, maps and, and folds and all that kind of good stuff. And one of the things that they provided was this future capability that had callbacks on it. So exactly the sort of thing we'd, we'd want. So again, look at the timeline here. This is circa 2011. Uh, so it's before the Scala future. It's before the completable future in Java. So it was a nice thing to have at the time. Um, and it did provide for a Java kind of customer listenable future. So let me digress super quickly. Um, why are we talking about this, right? So again, at Tendril, uh, we wanted to allow our engineers to work in Java as well as in Scala. Uh, so when we built our uh, listenable, or sorry, our Finagle Protobuf uh, plugin, um, we had that deal in listenable futures uh, so that we could do async all the way in Java and not have to know uh, anything about Twitter, not have to know anything about Scala. Uh, some of that was done for um, facade sort of reasons, so we could potentially rip out uh, finagle underneath if we decided we didn't like it. Um, and so some of those choices have still stayed with us. So listenable futures made up of a few different pieces. We have listenable future itself, which is basically a Java future with an extra um, add listener method for us to set up the callbacks on. But then we've got this helper uh, class futures that has all these nice uh, things that we would use combinator style. So we've got transform, uh, and there's a couple kinds of transform that correspond to map and flat map. We've got all as list and successful as list, so we can deal with lists of these things and convert them to um, a listenable future of list after we started with a list of listenable future. Catching and catching async in order to um, handle uh, recovery from failures. Uh, immediate futures, immediate failed futures, so again, we can build up those building blocks either for um, testing purposes or in branches where we know a, a result immediately. Um, we have a listening executor service, which is a decorator for a regular executor service that lets us create listenable futures. And we have settable future that's pretty analogous to promises. So transforms and callbacks, uh, we start with a listening decorator wrapped around a fixed thread pool. Um, and so now anything that we submit to this, like it's submitting to regular um, uh, executor service, um, instead of returning us a standard Java future, will return us a listenable future. Um, so uh, in do thing, I'm submitting a callable to that. Uh, then we're using futures.transform and passing it to a Guava function that does the apply and returns a listenable future. At the end, we're doing futures add callback. This is pretty ugly, luckily in uh, 2.12. Um, so Guava future and a couple of those other pieces are SAM types. So in 2.12, any of our lambdas in Scala automatically generate the uh, SAM type interfaces so we can get this much nicer. Um, but it's still kind of not very pleasant to use from Scala. It's not chainable. All those transform steps, they return listenable futures, but we can't just call dot transform, dot transform, dot transform. We gotta stick it in a val and call listen, uh, futures dot transform on it. Um, these don't work super great with uh, the type inference. Um, so you have to have type hints on a lot of these things. Guava function and Guava async function are um, you know, in different places in the type hierarchy. So you can't just use a, a regular Scala future and have it work with those. Um, transform and transform async before uh, Guava 220, they were both called transform. Um, so it's as if map and flat map were both called map and map, which, yeah, it works. It's an overloading, it's perfectly valid uh, Java or Scala, but um, does make it harder to work with. Um, now we have transform and transform async. Um, and now in the newest version, you have to pass an execution context everywhere and you can't do that implicitly, so that's kind of tricky to use from Scala as well. But you can make this a little bit, a little bit easier. There's uh, something called uh, the guilt foundation, uh, guilt, guilt industries or guilt tech uh, or something like that. 
uh, and they have provided some foundation classes, and one of them uh, is GFC Guava, provides us some nice um, things like uh, implicit conversions and things. Uh, we can call guavafutures.future, and it's apply, will create a listenable future for us. Uh, we can make a Scala future and say dot as listenable future on it. Um, and we can use map and flat map and it'll take care of mapping these things, uh, uh, doing the appropriate calls underneath. Incidentally, you can write this kind of stuff yourself, right? It's just writing an implicit conversion that hooks up the, um, creates a promise and hooks up the callbacks to resolve the promise. Uh, but it's nice that you can grab something else that does this for you. So in Java 8, we have completable futures. And finally, we have a pretty reasonable interface for doing futures with callbacks in Java. Um, but it's kind of a little bit interesting and different from the way that we're used to this in Scala. So we have uh, a single completable future, which acts as both the promise end and the future end. Um, when we create it, we can create it as a promise. Uh, we can use a supply async or run async. The supplier interface that uh, supply async takes uh, is basically just uh, an interface with a single get method. Uh, obviously, when you implement that, that can take, you know, that can be quick or that can take as long as it needs to take. Uh, run async is just a regular runnable, so all we get out of that uh, is um, a completable future of void, so we just know that it finished unless we do typical icky Java things and store uh, shared state or something, it's hard to get value out of that. So an example for a completable future, um, so I've started with a completable future promise style. Um, I'm gonna then apply async, then apply, then apply and then apply async are equivalent to map. Uh, I'll talk more about that in just a second. This is not map and flat map, but it's two variants of map. Um, and we'll, uh, take, take our eye and scale it. Our final stage, we also have kind of a weird uh, interface that's not quite what we would normally like in Scala. Uh, we get handed um, two arguments, and the first argument represents the success case, and the second argument represents the failure case. And if this were a successful future, the first one will be non-null, and the second one will be null. And if this is a failure, the second one will be non-null, and the first one will be null. So you have this ugly kind of handle R and T, if R's not null, do the happy path. If T's not null, do the exception path. Some point in the future, we're done. Complete on the completable future, and then uh, all of our subsequent then, then, trans, then applies, then apply asyncs, all that kind of stuff will happen. So the, the different apply and apply async, handle and handle async, pretty much all of the methods uh, have this regular version and async version. And the difference for those is the execution model. So when we call apply or when we call handle, those are gonna operate in the thread that resolved the prior completion stage. If we call apply async or handle async, then we're either gonna provide an execution context or we'll use the default exe uh, executor uh, to run that, that transform body. So the default executor is a fork join pool. Um, depending how that's configured, uh, might get a new thread, might not get a new thread. Um, that's all I wanted. Uh, so we have a number of different, uh, for different kinds of combinators, we have a number of different variants for whether we want a runnable or a supplier, um, whether we want a function uh, to operate on it or a consumer that's like a sync for it. Um, we don't have this recover with thing. We only have one kind of recovery. So in both Scala and Twitter futures, uh, we can recover a failed future by providing a new future. Uh, so we can either have uh, a process already going. Um, maybe uh, I referred to earlier, um, maybe I'm talking to a cache and talking to an actual computation. So maybe I've got a future already um, potentially being resolved and I wanna slot that in there. Maybe I wanna start some new work right when I'm recovering uh, and plop the future in there. So it's really replace this failed future with this, with this other potentially healthy future. Uh, but in the completable future, we don't have that. We can just recover with a value, not with a future value. Um, we have a couple which are uh, kind of interesting because they're slightly more efficient. Uh, in 
more efficient in uh, coding, not more efficient in performance. Uh, so in Scala, something like zip would return a future that is a future of tuple of the two different future types, right? So we've got, say, future event and future of string, and we zip them together. We're going to get future of tuple int string. Uh, and then if we want to do something with that, we're going to have to map it or flat map it to do that next operation. Uh, whereas the dot com, uh, then combine in completable future will immediately do that thing. We'll never get that intermediate future of tuple of whatever. Um, and then we've got that overall handle method, which I talked about on the other slide um, with this, this by function of the, um, the result, the T value, and the throwable value. So tasks. I want to just briefly talk about tasks. We're not using tasks yet. We're just starting to kind of look at, at them. Um, if uh, you guys didn't get a chance to see Alexandru's um, Monix talk earlier today, look for the recording of that. Um, there's task interfaces in Scala Z, in Monix, and in FS2. And for purposes of this talk, we can think about those as lazy futures. Um, so they don't run their bodies until we explicitly ask them to be run. Uh, so um, these are respective. Scala Z attempt run, Monix call run async, FS2 call unsafe run async. Once we call that, then it will run, typically give us a future value back depending on what the API of the thing is. So the nice thing when you're com uh, writing software with these uh, is you're not going to have unexpected computations or unwanted computations, right? You're building the pipeline up and then explicitly executing the pipeline at the end. If there's any reason that you can, as you build that thing up, know this is a failure, I'm done, I just want to return uh, you know, a failure condition back to my caller. I don't want to start executing that whole sequence of computations. You don't have to do that. And the nice thing for, for trying not to write bugs is because of that, you're not leaking any of those computations. If you didn't do them until you really meant to do them, um, they can't leak on you. Memoization is optional in these. By default, uh, none of the three um, save the values. So you can take that same task and run it over and over and over again. Uh, and it will typically redo the calculation. Uh, but you can optionally memoize it and basically cache that value. So when you run it the second time, you get the same one out. Uh, these are usually based on trampolines. I'm not going to say too much about that, but that's a mechanism for using a loop and heap uh, rather than space on your uh, stack. And there's cancellation support in all of these. So a quick example from Monix. This is basically from their, uh, from their documentation. We have this task. Um, in this example, we can't really observe whether it's running or not, but this is not running until we call the run async. Uh, and then at that point, we can match on the, um, so we can either do that directly, pass run async, uh, a partial function that's going to um, operate and determine whether we're success or failure and do whatever with it. Or um, we can also future style, say task run async, get a regular Scala future out of it and do our things. So comparison and recommendations. I put this big, uh, this big chart together. I, I'm not going to cover this in complete detail. Um, slides will be available. A uh, couple of things I want to point out from this. Um, so the cancellations, um, Twitter uh, does support cancellation, but it's cooperative. Uh, completable future does support cancellation. Uh, and they have an argument uh, that you pass in that says whether you want it to interrupt the thread or not. But as of right now, it ignores that argument and does not cancel the underlying thread. It just resolves that future with a canceled status with whatever um, uh, exception that you've passed in. Uh, and then in terms of uh, four comprehension, uh, Scala and Twitter, yeah, you can write four comprehensions. Guava, you can't unless you use GFC Guava. And completable future, you cannot unless you play similar tricks and write uh, implicit conversions and stuff or explicit conversions. Uh, and then for interop, so, um, so using Scala's future from, um, from Java is so-so. Um, you have to implement things like partial function. Uh, there's an abstract partial function that you can build from and things like that to do that. 
Uh, Twitter, on the other hand, provides some variants that are explicitly there for Java interop. They've really thought about Java interop, so that's, that's not, not, too, uh, not too difficult to use from Java. Guava, it's fair, not great in uh, Java for some of the same reasons that I talked about, about not being able to chain and things like that. Uh, but it's kind of a pain from, um, from Scala unless you use uh, GSC Guava or something. And um, Java completable future is pretty reasonable from both Java and Scala. Um, although I did have to give a few type hints uh, to make type inference work uh, well. So my recommendations overall is use whatever your libraries use. Like if you're staying in standard Scala, the standard Scala future is pretty good. There's not really a reason that you would pull Twitter futures in just to pull Twitter futures in. But if you're using Finagle or you're using something else from the Twitter ecosystem that operates in Twitter futures, uh, that'd be a good reason to pull them in. Um, unless you want to use some of those monitoring combinators or cancellation, yeah, give it a try and see if, uh, see if that works well for you. Um, if you do have to mix Scala and, and Twitter, by all means, use it by ejection. Don't rewrite that yourself. Uh, it's pretty, pretty lightweight and easy to use. Um, for Java interop, prefer completable future unless you're stuck with an, uh, a library that needs to do Guava. Um, it's just not worth, not worth it at this point. It was really good when it came out, but state of the art has moved on. A few other things you might look at if you're trying to do um, async, non-blocking, reactive kind of stuff. So reactive extensions, we've got observables and streams and stuff like that. That's all pretty good. There's bindings for that from a bunch of different languages. Um, streams, we have Scala Z, FS2, and Akka. Um, check out the Akka um, streams talk that Zach, and I can't remember his last name, gave earlier today. That's a, a good recording to check out. Um, obviously, we have actor model. Actor model is a different sort of concurrency model that might, be, might fit your needs. Um, and there's a coroutine library uh, that, uh, that is out uh, that might be worth checking out. It seems pretty early days, but it's a different uh, sort of cooperative uh, concurrency model that might, might be interesting to check out. So I'm Chris Phelps. Uh, I have examples of um, most of the stuff I talked about today on my GitHub, so you can check that out there. Um, and I think I have a few minutes for questions. I was wondering about the Scala futures. Do you know if the absence of the ability to cancel them is uh, a design decision that was made on purpose, or is it more just something that they never got around to adding? I do not know if there have been any, any thoughts or discussions around trying to add those. Hey, um, not, not a question, just a note. Um, when you're talking about tasks, so you mentioned that all three implementations support cancellation and memoization. That's not actually true. Only Monix task supports cancellation. Uh, the Scala Z is, stuff is a workaround that doesn't work well, and it doesn't have a good memoization story. So, you know, just FYI. Okay, excellent, excellent to know. Um, all three of them have things for cancellation and memoization in their APIs. It's really good to know that there, there might be gotchas underneath that. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thanks guys. <laughs>